Um, all right. So, so again, Sands Hall in conversation with Mary Melton. Um, brief housekeeping. Alta Live is the digital interview interview series we do here at Alta Journal. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor. If you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask questions for Sans. She and Mary will chat for about 30 minutes and then get to as many of your questions as we can. Please note, this will all be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. We're also going to send you an email with a link to this video, as well as Sans' incredible article in Alta and anything else relevant um, within the context of today's conversation. So we'll keep an eye out for that email. And again, if you've got to leave early, don't worry, it'll be posted to altaonline.com. Uh, before we begin, on a slightly more serious note, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge the tragedy in Texas yesterday. Um, sometimes it can feel hard to come together and talk about things like what we're gonna talk about today when something as devastating as what occurred in Texas happened. But we do want to acknowledge the incredible community um, in Texas and hope and um, know that they are coming together. Here at Alta, we very, very much value community. We're so happy to see so very many of you from all over the country and world today. Um, and we're honored that you've chosen to take this time with all of us. So thank you. Um, again, if you haven't already, let us know where you're zooming in from. And with that, I am delighted to turn it over to Mary Melton and Sands Hall. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Sands, so good to see you. I was I was a little worried there for a couple minutes, but I knew yes, you. Come I thought I was being clever restarting my computer a half an hour before we began, but something went wacky. So, anyway. well, if I've if I've learned something from the wonderful last few months of getting to know you and having worked with you on this story, I know that you were tenacious and uh, and get the job done. So I, I so appreciate you you being here. I imagine most of the people on the call have read your extraordinary story, but I also you know, think that we often do have some people who join Alta Live who haven't. You uh, proposed this story to me in August of last year. I looked it up to see what month it was. Kind of cold called me as a writer. We had a, a writer from our community of writers in common, Martin Smith, who had, I think, um, pointed you toward Alta. But could you tell me what that pitch was in a nutshell that you proposed to me last August for folks who just need some context for the talk we're about to have? Thank you all for your patience. Thank you, Mary and Beth. I'm sure it was a bit scary there. Um, I did pitch this story to uh, Alta um, under sort of the rubric of um, Me Too movement, that there was, while this story has been around for a while, uh, certainly in academic circles, um, I felt that it was time to take a new look at the degree of appropriation that Stegner had um, accomplished with uh, his book, Angle of Repose, for which he won the Pulitzer. And it just felt an incredibly timely um, story uh, in a very new and very relevant way. And I was really glad then uh, I heard back from Mary saying, uh, let's, let's go with this. And what was your, you had a unique connection to this story, which was for me at least what moved the story along. I had heard allegations of plagiarism around this before, having no idea of the depth of it that you would uncover and reveal in the story. Uh, but you did have a unique relationship to this particular novel. I did in that I moved to this lovely area of Nevada City Grass Valley um, a number of years ago. And uh, there was, of all things, a professional theater company here. I was a, a equity proudly union actor, and they actually were hiring equity actors in this very small, wonderful city. And um, I got to know this group of people and the wonderful artistic director, Philip Sneed, was the Foothill Theater Company. And he proposed the idea that we take this book, Angle of Repose, which was set in nearby Grass Valley, much of the contemporary story, the narrator's Lyman Ward story is set in Grass Valley. And of course, the latter part of the book, when uh, Susan Ward and her husband um, Oliver moved to Grass Valley, it's all set there. There's a mine that's called the Zodiac Mine in the book. There's a old house called the Zodiac House. Both of these are known as the North Star. So it seemed incredibly relevant to our time and place. And 
So we gathered together to talk about the possibility of adapting angle of repose into what we envisioned as being a sort of maybe two, like an afternoon evening show. So it would be a very like a Nicholas Nickleby kind of dramatic presentation. So you could really get the whole story, both the contemporary one set in the 60s and the um and the the historical one set from sort of the 1860s to the 1920s. Sorry, when you proposed this story to me, I you know I've edited a lot of crime stories in my career. And I didn't initially see it as a crime story. I saw it really as a, a, a literary criticism or, or a bit of you know, history, uh, a story that would really examine this. But as you began reporting it, and certainly with your first draft, it became clear to me that this was really a mystery that you were, um, that you were solving, you know, an, an onion you were, you were peeling. And as with any uh, person who's writing a crime story, inevitably you're gonna come upon some revelations that you didn't expect uh, as you start digging into the to controversy. Or in this case, what we really feel, I think you and I really agreed to was really a crime. Um, what, what, what were some revelations that you had about, maybe both about yourself because you do, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit in a, in a second, you do talk about yourself and, and bring yourself into the story, but also about Mary Halleck Foote who is the, the magnificent writer, you know, whose memoir and letters and journals were the basis for so much of the, the beautiful <laughs> phrasing and imagery that, you know, have been, so long been credited to, to Stegner. I think when I began to, when, when it was introduced to me uh, by my friend Tom Taylor, that actually there was some local dudgeon aimed in Stegner's direction. There was something about his using stuff from a local woman's diary and it all seemed ridiculous but then the the woman that was going to direct the show Lynn Collins handed me the reminiscences and I began to read them dutifully because I felt I should and all of a sudden I came across passage after passage characterization after characterization storylines after storyline that were identical to what I had just read in Angle of Repose so then that's when I began to feel I've got to actually go and take a deeper look at this. And that's when I drove down to Stanford where Mary Halleck Foote's letters to her friend, Helena uh, Augusta in the novel are stored. And I began to really um, uncover things. So probably one of the biggest, two big discoveries. One was I thought the plagiarism was outrageous. I mean, there was no other word for it although people pussyfoot around that um, in, Stegner's dedication to the family. Uh, he calls it borrowing. Or he thanks them for their loan of their ancestors. So we often use borrow as a kind of euphemism. But in fact, there was a lot of theft. So the first discovery was that it wasn't the plagiarism that was ultimately so upsetting. It was that he borrowed so con the huge arc of Mary Halleck Foote and Arthur's extraordinary life. And at the end, twisted into this awful little torrid romance that spoiled their marriage and the Ward's marriage. I, those are the fictional characters. They lived in bitter silence to the end of their days and the foot, the people on which they were founded, there was no adultery, there was no filicide, there were none of these things that Stegner warped, his own word, uh, towards the end of the book. So that was discovery number one, mm -hmm. uh, that, th that it was so much more devious than mm -hmm. I had thought, that even I had thought the second one was how much I responded to Mary Halleck Foote as a person and a writer and what she was living through and understanding her anguish and ache as she and her husband tried to create this vision of a dam of a some a way to bring water to arid lands when they were living in Idaho for 10 years, this dream they broke their backs and their hearts on. And um, just what what it was to live in those times, her very fine acute sense of language. I loved her drawings. I just came to appreciate and love her. And in fact, there really is a bit of a club of women I, so far. We've all just have, we call her MHF fondly as she is known and we just adore her. She is an extraordinary, like she, in the writing of the play, particularly when I was playing MHF and saying so many of her lines, I just felt like she was such a dear friend and almost, mm -hmm. Yeah, someone I knew really deeply, which of course I didn't, but it was, uh, that was really a profound discovery. I would imagine finding out that 
so much of her life was taken from her by Stegner. And as you say, rewritten in this way that was completely not reflective of this truly heroic life she she led at, and and really like profoundly close, it sounds like marriage that she did have. Like how how much anger did you feel about that that part of her life that she had no control over? Because anyone who knows anything about these accusations of plagiarism or says what, what people would often say to me is, oh well, I heard though that he had permission, so that's okay. And they automatically think, well, this is all based on her life. So I think there's this real feeling that, well, since it happened in the book, it must have actually happened in her life. Yes. That's one of the most troubling things that uh, even to this day, there are people uh, in Grass Valley, Nevada City area who think that Stegner told the real story and that there was this, uh, they like one of the daughters, granddaughters said to me, there was this sense that there's a there's a dark body in every you know cupboard. There's a skeleton in every closet, and Stegner unburied the one in the foots. And so that was um, tremendously infuriating. And also, I felt as I began to dig into this story, I something it tapped some enormous rage in me about what's been done to women for millennia. I went, I mean, I've always been very interested in spiritual matters um, and just studying the three great, you know, Western religions that grew up out of that postage stamp size country, Israel, just the amount of degradation and oppression of women that's happened. So it linked this story linked into something that felt much, much deeper and far more important. And I did feel as if in the writing of the play and in the re and re and rewriting of the play, because I continued to work on it and uh, try to make actually the points even cleaner and often used more humor, which I think is a great way to get points across. across I just felt this deep connection to this much larger story that needs to be told, which again, is one of the reasons I pitched it to Alta as I did, because I had certainly looked through the material when I wrote the play, but I wanted to really bring it to a new audience who, I'll just say that this story was known in academic circles. There was kind of this, mm, yeah, he did what he did, but there's two other things. One is the nuance that he borrowed so much of her life and then changed it. And people think that either he wrote the whole book or that was Mary Hallett Foote's life. And the second thing was, I wanted to bring it to an audience of people who had known and loved this book, who know and appreciate Stegner's writing. I just felt it was important to reveal this particular, um, he says it himself, the ways of fiction are devious indeed. And that he was, I think he made a real pact with the devil. I also think he thought it would, that her writing would never see the light of day. And uh, he just gambled, and um, I would like to think that he's on the losing end of that gamble, thanks to Alta. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine a lot of that audience who has, uh, you know, previously for not necessarily forgiven him, but just thought like, well, it's not that big of a deal, could point to many examples themselves, especially if they're female writers, of you know to occasions when they've had their words taken from them. You know, they've they've certainly you know if we can point to many times of ideas being appropriated or you know, even even live when you're in a in a conference room. <laughs> based on my experience, long long time experience in in, in plenty of conference rooms in my lives. Um, but um, I, I do feel like you would think that there'd be a little bit more, I don't know if sympathy is the right word, but or understanding about this. Like what, what do you, what do you think the, the road, what do you think the roadblock has been for, for people to not be as outraged about this as they should be? I think a lot of it falls, not always, but often down gender lines. Um, there were some very interesting responses. I'm so blessed the people that shared it on their various social media. And um, I was really touched. There was a, a couple of comments. Uh, Pam Houston um, posted it with a wonderful comment. I was very grateful to her. And there were a largely outraged, you know, what would happen? This is amazing. I didn't know this. And a couple of people wrote, 
with names like Alex and John uh, wrote, you know, this is a really old story. Everybody knows this or a fiction writer writes fiction. Once the when he writes the story, the story is his. And uh, I appreciated that one of the commentators said, "Hey, old white guys." Well, I'm sure they. I'm not sure they were old, but their definite names were at least male. Why didn't you actually read Professor Hall's story before you comment? Which I appreciated. So I do feel, and this was true when I first proposed it, the story to my dad, and certainly his literary friends. There was just kind of this, you know arms folded kind of, well, it's a writer, it's a great novel, won the Pulitzer. I don't think we should mess too much. And so I think one of the reasons, again, that I wanted to air the issue newly was I believe there's a new frame around accounting going on. What actually happened as opposed to he was within his rights or he won the Pulitzer or he got permission from the family or, you know, someone pointed out to me, that I wrote in the uh, essay that he supposedly had copyright if the reminiscences weren't published. And several people pointed out to me, uh, writing is writing it to somebody's. It doesn't have to be published to have copyright. So there were all these excuses that were given. In the end, I don't think hold up. And I believe that the roadblocks were one of era, of time period, um, of assumptions. And of course, all over the place, we're trying to tackle exactly those things now. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned your father, uh, who, uh, for those who don't know, uh, was Oakley Hall, who was himself a deeply respected writer of the Western canon. His Warlock was Pulitzer nominated. Um, did you think of him often when you were writing this story? Did you ever think you were writing the story, a story that you wish he could have read? Well, tears rise in answer to that. I just think that they would be on this Zoom call, which of course didn't exist when either one of them <laughs> passed away and would just be uh, over the moon proud and pleased. And that's the thing that I so appreciated. He, in the character of historian in my play Fair Use, um, dad got a, a nice outing. He's not, the character's not based on him, but a lot of dad's wisdom and pithy comments uh, were I was able to give him and the character known as WS, which was of course my, my version of Wallace Degner. Um, and they both got to speak as writers and as historians, as scholars, as fathers and get to say some really cool things. And I think he was so nervous watching he, the opening night of Fair Use. Of course he was, but tremendously proud. So I, I think that's one of the great things. The support they gave me for this story was 100%. And I will always be grateful. That's so wonderful you had that experience and that he was able to be there. That's incredible. Oh. Um, yeah. If you don't mind us pulling back the curtain maybe a little bit on the editing of the story um, between the first draft and the second draft, you know, I, I pushed you a, a little bit to put more of yourself in this story. Uh, and that's often something that editors don't do, right? They often are like, get yourself out of the story. Um, but I, you know, I, I pushed you to, to, to explore a little bit more about, about this, you know, your, your, your feelings around this. And um, I'm, I'm just curious, did that make you feel vulnerable or, or queasy or was there any, any struggle? I mean, it's always a struggle putting pen to paper for me or it, 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 always, um, but I'm just, I'm curious what your, what was your initial reaction to that? A couple of them. One is I am a novelist. I am the author of a memoir and I had read uh, Julia Flynn Seiler's fine work in your magazine and Martin J. Smith's fine work in your magazine, all kinds of other writers in your wonderful magazine. And I was coming to you as a nonfiction writer. I was going to be a journalist with this story with a little bit of myself sprinkled in as needed to tell the story. So it was the height of irony that what you said was we need more of you and more of your voice. It was both a surprise and a, a, and a delight because it gave me permission. The other thing I think uh, most writers that are on this, uh, on this uh, webinar right now would agree that as you get older as a writer, you just crave editing. You're, and especially when it's the kind of editing, Mary, you were just so brilliant. I could just, I'm just so grateful to you for how you helped me shape this essay. It's just huge um, that you're so 
okay, great, that word has to go. Oh, so great, that paragraph is gonna change. Oh, so she's just asked me this great question, why? And I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole and give that answer, which is a paragraph, frankly, I am so, the one about the Fisher person that we decided we needed to use rather than fisherman. I just was so grateful for your suggestions and um, vulnerable, yes, but all in the best service to this story. Um, it's just my great um, goal and ambition that people know who Mary Halleck Foote is and that I write the wrong that was done her. And I was so incredibly grateful to have an opportunity to do so at, at length in this fine, fine magazine. And may I just say the illustrations were just so amazing. They were gorgeous. Yeah, we'll share those with everyone if you haven't seen them yet, they're, they're beautiful. Um, and, and thank you for, for that chance. I'm that odd writer who actually loves to be edited as well. Like I'm, I'm every set of eyes is always, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of it. Um, I, I'm so curious when the story actually went live, were you nervous about it? I was tremendously excited and I was very nervous because I do know that there are a lot of people who cherish what Stegner did as a, as a writer. Um, one of the things I am able to do in the play, because I have this foil in the form of historian, is to really present all the very positive conservation matters that Stegner involved himself in and how important he was to that movement. And I felt that I could be attacked, I suppose is the word, for not taking all of that into consideration as many words as bless your heart I was given, it still there was a lot of things that couldn't be covered. Um, and that was one. So yes, but more than anything, I just was loaded for bear, I guess is the strange phrase. I was just like, here we go. I'm so excited. Let's see what happens. And um, it was, the response has been deeply gratifying. Yeah. I mean, are there some um, reactions that you were um, surprised by at all or um... I, I mean, I, I know just from following our Twitter um, commentary around the story on Alta Journal's feed, you know, uh, people may be suggesting that his Pulitzer be taken away or that perhaps the Stegner Fellowship at Stanford be renamed. Uh, and, and, and did you expect any of that or like what, what like let's talk a little bit about the reactions that, that you got? Those two I didn't. And in fact, I looked up our uh, Pulitzers ever revoked and found out that the one we talked about yesterday during our successful rehearsal, uh, <laughs> Janet Cook of the Washington Post who invented some information in a award-winning article, she didn't, she returned her Pulitzer, but they've never revoked one. So there is the answer to that, but it didn't really occur to me. It just, there's a lot about the book that you can say he shaped, you know, the root of the word fiction is form. So Stegner did form a lot of that novel. So I think that there's, you know, you, you can easily make an argument for why the Pulitzer's here at his. Um, as far as revoking his name or taking his name from the Stegner writing, I mean, Stanford writing program, I just don't, you know, I think it would be great if Stanford considered that, but I don't know. I think the things that moved me most about the responses were people Re sort of relating similar things that had happened to them. You mentioned Mary, like in a meeting or um, ideas that had been taken. Um, one woman wrote movingly about how she was just thinking how her mother did all this work for all these men, did so much of what they took credit for and got none of it. Um, so were lots of stories of that nature that, um, uh, one, again, very moving post was about a uh, woman bringing this, this, these, I, these ideas up, not the one about Stegner, but just in general to her father. And that in a moment of um, ill-guided, what he felt would be shared information, he said, you know, um, it wasn't too long ago that we just thought women were inferior beings. And that she said it just caused her to weep because she couldn't believe that's where the conversation had gone. Oh. And she said, in the end, it was an excellent conversation. And he said, and she says she realized he was just saying it to sort of make a, a different kind of point, but that it caused her to burst into tears that that was even a consideration. So it's not 
it's not so I'm always struck how hard we have been fighting for the same rights and we are in the fight even now and rights are being taken away right and left um it's and I'm also struck that we could not have the vote we women in the United States if men had not agreed to give it to us and because men were the ones so there's just this big balance about um I'm, I'm I'll always be grateful for those men who voted for that amendment you know it was men who had to vote for it so there's it's it feels like it is literally two steps back and one two step forward and one and a half back but maybe some progress is being made and I but I just believe the story is is part of it it's just if it's just a drop in the bucket of the large ocean of these wrongs and someone is made aware of it that is that is the work I want to do and that's and absolutely your writing has, has made so many people aware of this and provoked many conversations just among my friends and and colleagues so I can only imagine how many uh conversations it's provoked elsewhere um you say in the story that you you want to give Mary Halleck but her life back um and something we haven't really talked about that I'm 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 curious about and maybe since we've got a couple hundred very engaged folks listening to us right now what are ways we can manifest that, not just for her, but for anyone like her? And we can point to, and we, we talked a little bit about it in the story, many, many instances of this, you know, across the arts and, and, and film and fine arts. And um, what, are, what are ways that we can give life back to someone like Mary who had it stolen? Well, of course, the first answer that comes to mind is what artists can do to bring those stories alive and make them vivid and remarkable them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, to give mm -hmm. them another response to the essay that i was really moved by was a woman's husband said to her uh that fitzgerald was in his within his rights to use zelda's memoir because she wasn't a very good writer and Zelda was it I mean and he Fitzgerald was a genius and the husband went on to say and just as I could use anything you share with me because I'm a better writer than you are and she said that was the end of my sharing and writing with him but I just think the spate of movies that are coming out about the kind of wrongs that have been done plays that make those efforts songs that make those efforts I think that there's just a way to bring the information to people as vividly as possible. I'm grateful for so many uh, articles, essays, books that try to point out the wrongs and and uh, make it as um, intriguing as to follow the mystery and and to engage the reader in the right and wrong of 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 these incredible. Um, crimes, to use that word, that have been effected against so many women's work uh, and women's ideas uh, over yeah. millennia, centuries, certainly. Yeah, maybe we can start a GoFundMe to get the book back in print. It'd be so I nice. I would love that. I think, I think to have, and also I would love if some of Mary Hallett Foote's novels were published. You know, she writes in a particular style. It's kind of Henry James meets uh, someone a little more verbose, maybe um, Wilkie Collins or something like that. I but love she's Collins. Got, I'm such a fan of Wilkie Collins. <laughs> she's got great ideas. She sets scenes. She's wonderful with inner thought and plot. Um, and I would love to see some of her novels make it back in and to print. Um, and certainly those reminiscences, the current foreword um, that it's given is essential because he did such a great job um, uh, to bring all of the, she, she thinks she has so many poems and quotations in her mind all the time that they just sort of seep out on the page and his footnotes are great about pointing out when they do that and also just talking about when she's shading what might be the truth. Um, uh, because as she says somewhere, it's hard to be fair as well as kind, you know, when you're writing reminiscences. Um, so truthful as well as kind, I think is the quote. So um, it would be wonderful to have the Huntington Library Press bring out, I was amazed it got a second edition. Maybe it's time for a third. Yeah. 
Um, before we bring Beth in to, uh, just I know we have several questions from our, our, our audience. I just, I'd love to just know, um, you know, you're a writer, a uh, performer, um, a, a teacher, but you know, in this case, you're a writer writing about two writers. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm just curious if you learned anything or had about your own writing through this or, or, or what's that like? I mean, maybe a little bit about your process, but just, I think that would be, I know you said you you feel like you've befriended um, MHF, which is wonderful. Um, how, how does that feel? Well, I think one of the perhaps ironic things is that I have become incredibly engaged with the idea of a novel that moves between a contemporary time and a historical one. So that's a nice big uh, theft of its own kind from Stegner, although I know he didn't invent that. I found yeah. that an incredibly uh, satisfying way to both read and to write. Um, and uh, so that's certainly one sort of just clear lesson. Um, there are things watching how Stegner took Mary Halleck Foote's scenes that she described, she maybe have narrated them in her reminiscences and how he put them into, dramatized them into scene in the um, in Angle of Repose, which I think is a lesson of sorts, I think could be used as an actual lesson, like the difference between a narrated scene and a dramatized scene. Mm -hmm. From Mary Halleck Foote, um, amongst the things I cherish so deeply are her, her, I think because she was a, a, a an illustrator, uh, she worked with pen and ink a lot, that she is so good with light and shadow. I think one of my favorite quotes, um, she's describing living out in Idaho and she says, she's talking about the, the desert, the color of the greenery in the desert. And she says, as uh, moonlight unto sunlight is that desert sage to other greens things like that that would just knock me sideways or mm -hmm. I also loved that she was so on metaphors at one point she talks about um like the uh town of Leadville which is on the continental divide pretty much and she talks about the that the town was on the ridge pole of the continent uh, using a tent metaphor because she went camping a lot and I love things like that of course her beautiful phrase, Angle of Repose, from which Stegner gets his title. She's mm -hmm. sitting with the juniors, that's Arthur's assistants in this room. And she's thinking, she says, often I thought of one of their phrases, Angle of Repose, which was too good to waste on rock slides and heaps of sand. Each of us was creeping and crawling and gasping along to find what was that angle. And we were none of us ready for repose which mm -hmm. has its own life force in it. It's, you know, mm -hmm. we're not ready to lie down yet. We're working on, on what this angle of repose is. So those things about her, I just, plus just her lively nature coming through her writing are mm -hmm. exemplary. Yeah. Thank you so much for, um, for, for bringing us this story um, and just for bringing such, you know, shedding such light and, and introspection, uh, you know, on, on her writing. I'm, I'm excited to have Beth join us. I think she's gonna come back with some, some questions from the audience. Um, indeed, Sans, I can tell that you have a, a background in theater as you were just like, once you're on camera, ready to go. <laughs> There's um so the is cutting, I will say the heart was pounding pretty hard. <laughs> so was mine. Hi. Um someone had asked, first of all, a wild um conversation in the comments that I have been following. If people have got strong opinions about this. Okay. Um one one, yeah, one person did ask for an example. And so um Sans, I imagine as you were running through the Sierra Foothills, you did not grab your copy of Alta. So if I may, I'm going to read a brief excerpt from A Victorian Gentlewoman in the Far West by MHF, I believe we call her. And then Helena dawned on my 19th year like a rose pink winter sunrise in the bare halls of Cooper, sweet and cold after her walk up from the ferry. Across the city, we came together and across the world in some respects. Her sharings in books and friends were stored honey of my girlhood. Salt is added to dried rose leaves with the perfume and spices when we store them away in covered jars, the summers of our past. And now, Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose. 
And then Augusta dawned on my 19th year, like a rose pink winter sunrise, sweet and cold from her walk up from the ferry. Across the city, we came together and across the world in some respects. Her sharings in books and friends were, sto were the stored honey of my, girl of my girlhood. Salt is added to the dried rose petals with the perfume and spices when we stored them away in covered jars, the summers of our past. There you go. Um, all right, a, no a number of questions for you. I hope that, that that's one of several examples. Um, I'll just say to the person who asked, if you open up your book of Angle of Repose and look at anything that's indented or, and or a slightly different font size, that's almost invariably copied verbatim from her writing. And I do have lots of other examples of scenes that he lifted quotations from and dialogue from that he then, as I said, put into scene himself. There is a lot of just reading the book side by side would be rather revelatory, I think. Um, uh, someone kind of points out uh, that they're being led to believe that you, Sands, discovered or were the first to unearth this, but they had heard about this, rumors of this long, long ago. Um, other critics have noticed and written about this. So, so where, where do you kind of fit in, in terms of this issue? Well, I think it says right smack dab in the early part of this essay that this had been known in academic circles. And I said it pretty much early in this conversation as well. It's been known since the book came out that he borrowed from uh, extensively from her writing. Um, I think where I, I hope I have contributed to the conversation is to add the rather subtle nuance, although I don't think it's subtle at all, that he borrowed so much from her life and then changed it so completely at the end. And to me, that is the, um, the part that often gets dismissed. Well, plagiarism, because it's, I mean, we take, as you did so beautifully, Beth acknowledging the horror that took place yesterday, plagiarism seems pretty small in relationship to a shooting. I mean, it's ridiculously small, it's nothing. However, there is the theft of the life that took place that is a kind of violence, um, not certainly not as bad as shooting someone's child, but there is a violence. And that is what I'm trying to point out in my essay. I doubt I am the first to do so, um, but I know that that subtlety of how he borrowed so much and then at the end of the novel literally writes in the guise of his narrator Lyman Ward I am at a place where my grandmother hasn't done the work for me I have to make it up and less than 50 pages from the end of the book he does that's when he starts making things up that weren't part of Mary Foote's life so I think that the scandal or the controversy whatever the word would be has been around since very early on um, a woman named Mary Ellen Walsh wrote an extraordinary essay called Suck You By and Other Monsters back in the 80s, in which she completely detailed the plagiarism and his not very good handling of women in general. So yes, it's been around for a long time. And I try to make that, that clear. It's like, it's people know it, but do they know the nuances of it? Um, I've got a two-parter, and I think that Mary, I'm going to direct the first part of this at you. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah, get ready. It's interesting how, you know, for no softballs today, folks. Um, James points out that stories about plagiarism in literature are frequent and have only recently attracted controversy. I don't know about that. Um, Stegner explained his use of unpublished archive, archival letters etc. He goes on to, to uh, along this. Um, his que James question is, why have we not seen a feature story in Alta about Wallace Stegner? He is rightfully regarded as a dean of Western literature. Um, why is the only incomplete reference to Stegner in Alta a scandal reminiscent of Me Too gender conflicts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we certainly have, uh, you know, Stegner is, 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 I think we mentioned, if we didn't, you know, um, you know, one of the, the, the true like, writers of the Western canon. I mean, just revered, um, and um, and you know, we're a quarterly, uh, you know, so we we are selective in the stories that we uh, that we do. And to be honest, like I don't think anyone had, and this isn't really like an excuse for it, but like I, there had, there hadn't been a, a story pitched to us about Stegner that was unique. 
uh, that had a, a certain perspective. Um, and I didn't see this really as a story about Stegner. And I know that seems really strange. There's a huge illustration of him and he's a main figure in the story, but I saw it as something larger than that. Um, it wouldn't preclude us writing about Stegner again sometime. Um, and it doesn't mean uh, that it's the only perspective that we have on him. And, and Sands acknowledges in the story that he's a be magnificent writer. And that angle of repose is, I'm trying to remember exa your exact wording of it, Sans, but I think this is un unquestionably a, a magnificent book, right? So that's that's not the question here. It's just, uh, and it, this kind of does it, ans it answers a little bit the last question, I hope too. Um, you know, stories that um, may feel like, oh, I feel like I've heard that that doesn't necessarily mean you know the depth of a story or that we can't revisit a story and look at it through a new lens. Uh, and so, especially for this one, like I just, I personally just had no idea um, just how egregious, honestly, that this was until really Sands was sharing those comparative um, passages from both books. And it was uh, really shocking. I guess Sands part two is for you. And this one comes from, um... Alta's assistant editor, Jessica Blau, who asked, who interviewed you um, and also asks, you know, we, in our, in our masthead, Alta lists our inspirations. Um, and they're among an array of incredible people like Mark Twain and Jack London and Harvey Milk. Um, and let me find a woman, <laughs> um, <laughs> Julia Morgan is Wallace Stegner. Stegner. Do you, Sans Hall, think that we should remove him? Does this warrant removal from our inspiration list? And I will note that there has been one prior Alta removal. Thoughts that is on? a fascinating question. To me, I guess my answer would be, and um, perhaps because I'm the age I am and a bit uh, squishy on certain matters, um, I think that it should not be removed because I believe that his work as a writer, as a teacher, and as a conservationist um, are enormous. He made an enormous mistake. As someone wrote in a comment uh, on social media, uh, why didn't he spend his ta talents writing a prize winning biography? Um, and one of the damning statements that Stegner makes about that is that he says her life wasn't important enough uh, to write a mere biography. He says, by converting her to fiction, I had the chance to make her immortal, quote unquote. So I guess my answer would be, I don't think so, because I think there's a larger mo movement inside of Stegner than simply this story. I mean, I think he is a bit of a misogynist, a man of his time in his books. I think there's that famous book, Why I Can't Read Wallace Stegner, which is also about the way he treats Native Americans. So there's all kinds of uh, ammunition towards, towards the possibility of that action. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm softer than that about the, the uh, idea. Maybe though we could consider adding Mary Halleck Foote. That, that is. That would be so amazing. Um, it's Even interesting. People would go, who? <laughs> they'll get it sooner or later. Maybe they'll go we'll Google her. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, oh, Jillian asked, who is the previous removal? It was a father, Unifero Sarah. We have an article on that. We can actually, I'll, I'll include a link to, to the decision around that. Um, that would be great. It was a long time ago. I hope I'm remembering that correctly, but I think I am. Um, last question. I think, I know we've gone over, but we had a thrilling um, it, beginning to this. Um, Ellen asks Sands, please talk about the play you wrote about the controversy, the structure and your decision to write the story as a play. Oh gosh, thank you so much. Um, when I brought back all that information that I had gleaned about what Stegner had done to the work of Mary Halleck Foote to the producing company, to the theater, um, to our artistic director and the various director, lighting designer, costume designer, all those people, there was a grumpy agreement. And I was basically, I'm not gonna write that play. I just can't put my energies behind it. And in a move that I really admire because Philip Sneed, who is now the um, uh, working as associate director of, um, of Arvada Center in Denver, very fine artistic director, uh, I said, okay, um, he could have found another director. I couldn't find it. He could have found another writer to do his play, but he chose not to. 
And then I had said to him, what I can imagine is Mary Halleck Foote and Wallace Stegner talking to each other. What would they say? And the only place that can happen, and it's just blessed theater, is in that ether that theater provides. Um, obviously, film provides it as well. But And so he called me up and said, let's apply for an NEA grant and see if we can, you can, you can work on that play and we'll get an NEA grant to do a you know, first reading or, or first production of it. So that's what we did. And so as I conceived of the play, there was um, a playwright named Playwright who was living in the house of her father historian because she was estranged from her husband. And that allowed me a lot of leeway with the Mary Halleck Foote uh, stuff as well because of the estrangement issue and talking about uh, men and problems with that um, marriage, marriage problems which Foote had some of. Then there was a character named MHF, who was my version of Mary Halleck Foote, and a character named WS, my version of Wallace Stegner. And they are very much themselves, but they're also very much figments of the playwright's imagination. And it was good, it was lovely to be able to have that fictional character as Stegner had Lyman Ward to create my characters. So they were, I was the author of all of it, but the playwright was the author of the people in the play, which was very fun to play with, that meta stuff. Then I had, at the time, five actors playing Mary Halleck Foote and her fictional counterpart and um, Arthur Foote and his fictional counterpart and three other actors who played many, many characters. I, I subsequently cut out those three subsequent, the other characters and made it just six people because it was enough of a story to tell. I missed having things like Mary's sister whom um, Stegner just gets rid of, um, and things like scenes about miscarriages where Mary Halleck's sister puts his sister is hugely important, which are gone from the novel, things that I felt were important. But in the end, I felt the story was enough. And there's a lot of comedic stuff because the play, playwright and W.S. tell the actors, Mary Halleck, the foot, the Mary Susan and Arthur Oliver, they tell them, no, play the scene this way, no, play the scene this way. So there's a lot of very on the nose, very on the dime turns. And I'm the playwright makes Mary, I mean, makes Susan really haughty and really nasty and really flirty just to get the point across so that the difference between Mary and Susan is profound. And Arthur is, is very um, earnest and profound and Gary Cooper. And then as Arthur, he's just a little more easygoing. So those transitions between the two characters, which were playwrights, mine and playwrights invention, made for a very funny, very funny uh, uh, circumstances until we get to the death of Agnes when things of course are no longer amusing. Um, and so um, I love it that people, that play was produced, you know, almost 20 years ago now. And I still get people stopping me on the street here in my local town saying they still are talking about it, still arguing over the breakfast table with their wife about what was actually, what went on. Cause I made in the play case of the play, the audience was the jury. They got to walk out wow. thinking whatever they would think. Cause I just presented things as I saw them. Thanks for that question. Ellen, and it sounds like it's going to be staged in, in Boise in the comments. Very excited about that up in uh, Boise in, in sort of, I think it's the actual readings, the 24th of September. Okay. And we have a really cool venue and great actors. So I'm very excited. Oh, about Alta it. road trip. Yes. Yeah, road trip. <laughs> um, with that, what an exciting and important and um, dicey conversation today. I'm so grateful. Yeah. To both of you, Sands, and my be beautiful, wonderful colleague, Mary, um, and thank to our, our very engaged audience, all of you, thank, thank you. you. Before, yeah. before you go, I do want to invite you next week. I'm excited to welcome um, writer Peter C. Mancall, a historian and professor at USC, as, as well as Brian Colbert, who is a San Anselmo council member for a discussion on Sir Francis Drake and um, up here in Marin County where I'm located his name has been removed from the high school, but the high school is still on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard it's it's a question of both the explorers history um, complicated history and renaming um, as we move forward so a little bit along these lines again, um, that is June 1st Wednesday June 1st at 1230 here at Alta live. 
Sam's. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you, dear audience. I'm so moved to have so many of you here. I look forward to reading the comments. Mary, thank you with all my heart for your work on this essay. And Beth, thank you for this. It's great. And John, thank you. <laughs> Our belts are. Yeah. Yeah. It was an honor to work with you, Sans. And I just want to say, like, this story doesn't stop here. Uh, you know, I, I really would encourage everyone to continue to engage with it and, and talk to us at, at was it letters at altaonline.com, I think, Beth? Yeah, email. Our, oh, yeah. Please keep these comments coming. In fact, we've been saying um, in the work chat, we have a separate work chat, um, okay. that there's so much, there's so much emotion and passion about this topic in the comments. Email us. Um, you can do info at altaonline.com is probably the easiest. My phone will bling when that happens. Um, so please do let us know and uh, you know how you feel. If you have something to add to this, we might actually end up publishing these either online or in the magazine. This has been okay. an extraordinary topic that has really um, led to a lot of important discussion and conversation. So thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank, thank you so you much. Take care all. Bye.